Before I start, this title was actually chosen by Stuart Wenham. Um, so firstly, he apologises for not um, being able to or being here today and secondly, I'd like to apologise that you will have to put up with me for the next 20 minutes or so. So to start off, like we'll be talking about hydrogen passivation and that's essentially what a lot of our work is based on. This is uh, jointly funded by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, um, ACAP, and a large number of industry partners, um, some of them who are here today. And you'll see a large number of authors. Um, I may have left uh, some people out, sorry. So what is hydrogen? Well, really, it's like beer for silicon solar cells. And you guys might be thinking that's just for my love of beer, but I assure you that's not the case. There's a perfectly good scientific explanation, and here it is. See, we have all of these defects in silicon, and with hydrogen, it, it's not like that the problem goes away. These defects are still there, but it can help us forget about them. And why is that? Is it allows for better lifetimes in silicon through a reduction in the recombination active defect um, concentration, and hence the acronym BEER. And we're, we're very lucky. <laughs> And we're very lucky here at Spree, we have a, a good intake of international um, students and researchers and we'd like to cater for uh, all of our friends in Europe. So here we have the alternative acronym, also BEER. So the, the links go on and on and we've got some of our friends from Apollo on Solar, so uh, uh, Roland Einhaus might look, like to put his hand up up the back. Um, producing technology for alternative um, methods of silicon purification and he's also had involvement at IMEC which is another leading institute for solar around the world and this brings us to our first question for this trivia so we've got part of this um, seminar will be based on trivia with prizes for the correct answer so IMEC is located in a town called Leuven and there's a prize for who can name this beer hydrogen rich um, beer that uh, particularly uh, uh, popular with the, the Belgian students. And of course, this is what I was drinking quite a lot of whilst writing my thesis on advanced hydrogenation. So you see this uncanny link between beer and hydrogen. And the answer is that beer is rich in hydrogen. And that's what we're aiming to do with solar cell is using this to improve the quality of silicon. So looking at beer, what that has done, even back in the 90s, this was a key part of, that led to the world records for the pearl cell, solar cells. So using this, we had this El Nil process um, applied, and this is what gave us our, our world record efficiencies. So there's a certain structure on the back surface where we've got a, a P-type non-diffused layer, and it's really probably the worst thing you can do to try to passivate the rear surface, having an undoped P-type surface. And so with that structure, we only get about 590 millivolts. And the work here was using a forming gas, so this hydrogen containing gas. And we can use it to passivate these defect states at the, um, the interface of the silicon and silicon dioxide. But uh, that, that's not necessarily so effective, and it only takes the voltage up to 620 millivolts, which is pretty poor in the standard of solar cells currently on the market. So um, an El Nil process was developed and could transform this uh, structure up to about 20. Uh, 690 millivolts and you see that really the, the hydrogen passivation in the, uh, the pearl cell was this key to achieving these world records and this is even on a, a high lifetime uh, float zone material which is probably the best material you can get for, for making solar cells out of. But unfortunately it's not always the case and some of these lifetimes um, in silicon can be quite poor. So if we look at beer today, and this is what it looks like, you'll see that Stuart hasn't aged a bit. He's still looking quite good. Um, with some of our recent developments, um, they were hailed as breakthroughs for the solar industry. So we've developed um, an understanding of how to manipulate hydrogen in silicon to enhance the effectiveness of this passivation. So we're awarded the, um, the IET um, AF Harvey Prize for Engineering, which is across all disciplines um, in engineering across the world and were awarded this prize. And we've had quite significant um, funding from industry and the governments based on this technology. So getting to the uh, hydrogenation of the defects, as I mentioned, we've got all of these defects in silicon. So this is a photoluminescence imaging um, or image. Um, so this technique for looking at these defects in silicon was actually developed in the, at UNSW um, about a decade ago. 
And then we have our hydrogen, which comes from our um, anti-reflection coatings, um, so our silicon nitride layer. And our aim is to perform a hydrogenation process. We might release the hydrogen from these layers um, as we go through the, the metal contact formation. And then we aim at forming a, a recombination inactive hydrogen defect complex. So it doesn't hurt the performance of the solar cells. And with that, we can greatly improve the quality of the silicon. And this brings me to the second question in the quiz is who actually provided this laser damaged um, sample for the initial um, PL um, uh, technique, image, um, imaging technique. So one of the fundamental problems in, uh, of hydrogen in silicon is really understanding it. There's an immense amount of literature available um, with a lot of inconsistencies and that makes it quite hard for us researchers to, to understand what's going on. So here we have um, some uh, diffusivity data from the literature, which shows the, the, how quickly hydrogen can move through silicon depending on temperatures. And this can vary by about five orders of magnitude for a given temperature. And so th there's a whole range of different um, contradictory theories um, based on the movement of hydrogen, etc. And one thing that's been noticed is that hydrogen can take on different charge states in the silicon. And uh, this was even known back in the 80s and 90s, but it was typically seen as something detrimental for us to, to passivate these defects because hydrogen naturally goes into the wrong charge state. So a, a state that has low mobility and low reactivity. And this is when we developed our advanced um, hydrogenation technology. And as we know, all of us, is that sunlight is the, the answer to all of the world's problems. And it's the same with this hydrogen-based um, uh, passivation technique. So we use sunlight to manipulate the, the charge state of hydrogen in silicon so we can um, increase the mobility and increase its reactivity. So we can passivate a larger number of defects in the silicon and also uh, speed up that process. And so now here, Darren, is where you'll figure out what CRAP stands for. It's this chronic recombination affected photovoltaic grade silicon. So <laughs> in comparison to the, um, the, the high quality float zone silicon that uh, Martin Green and his team was using in the 80s and 90s, it's not necessarily a material that most of the industry is using. Some of it looks like this. So you'll see these, these darker regions represent recombination sites here as a, a a cast monosilicon wafer that has all these dislocation clusters. And this, the presence of these defects has really killed this technology. And with hydrogen, uh, using our advanced hydrogenation process, we've figured out the key to how we can make these defects essentially disappear and convert this into some of almost the highest quality silicon that you could buy. And we can also do that, this on uh, finished cells. So we can take a 16.7% efficient cell. This is uh, one of the, the standard kind of solar cells of what you'll see in solar panels all around the world. It's multi-crystalline silicon, full area aluminium back surface field. And taking that already finished solar cell, we can increase it to an efficiency of 18%, which is quite remarkable. So we can take the existing technologies and increase the relative performance quite substantially. And this means that we can potentially reduce the cost of solar. And for some of the skeptics on P-type silicon and that like these N-type uh, technologies, well, N-type can be crap too. So some of these uh, wafers we get, reject wafers from our industrial partners can have these large defect regions around the edge. And in comparison to a float zone sample that has a, a relatively high lifetime, some of these, um, these wafers can look even worse than the P-type multi-material now on the market. But once we apply our hydrogenation process, well, the, the float zone uh, doesn't change, it was pretty good to start with, but we can get remarkable increases in this lifetime um, on, from these, these highly defected material. And it means that this reject material is now compatible with making 23-24% uh, efficient devices. So it could potentially reduce the cost of solar or the need for these purification techniques. So then we have process induced defects. So rather than some of these structural defects that are naturally incorporated into the, the solar cell or the wafer during crystallization, we can have a range of processes which uh, are formed, or form these defects in the silicon. 
such as oxygen precipitates using these high temperature processes, diffusion, oxidation, etc. Or with laser-based uh, laser processes, so taking some precursors for our laser dope selective emitter technology, after we've formed the, the rear metal structure, we introduce these defects into the solar cell to form our front surface electrodes. And one of the keys to hydrogen passivation is that we have to form these defects before we attempt to passivate them. So even though this um, ALBSF formation is treated as really the industrial standard for hydrogenation in um, commercial silicon solar cells, it won't be effective on the, the defects that we uh, generate after this process. So we, we have to apply a, a process after. And we can get quite substantial efficiency enhancements doing this. And similar for these um, oxygen precipitates, etc. So uh, a, a real key to hydrogenation is understanding these defect systems and applying these techniques after we generate um, the, uh, the defects. So once we get into these light-induced defects, we have another level of complexity, and this touches on um, what Martin uh, mentioned, um, the boron oxygen defects. So these, these defects that represent material instabilities in the field, and the, the problem with these is that the defects don't form during the normal processing sequence, so we have no uh, chance to passivate them using conventional processes. And one example of this is a BO, so, or commonly known as the boron oxygen defect, and it can be quite degrading. So we can take out 20% efficient solar cell um, perk, and suddenly we put it out under sunlight for about uh, two days, and the, the efficiency can drop um, somewhere between 5 and 10% relative. And a lot of our work recently has been focused on this defect system in understanding how we can solve this. And some of that work essentially dates back to um, some developments by Constance Uni back in 2006 where they, they showed uh, a permanent recovery, but we've had a couple of recent breakthroughs in the last year or so, and I'll go over them now. Now, the, the first is the concept of exercise. So exercise, why is that important? Because we can um, accelerate the formation of BO. So um, this will come to our next question is, can you name this um, famous player with a biography edition named Solar Editions. So, uh, and what is exercise? Well, it's this enhanced formation of this boron oxygen complex into Colsey silicon through majority carry injection. So, one of our papers we're about to publish by Nitten, um, who may be somewhere in this room, we've figured out the key of how to accelerate this defect formation, and that's to inject more holes. So we shine a lot of light, essentially, and increase the majority carry concentration. And like exercise, it's dependent on your fitness. And we can, we can think of the fitness of a solar cell as being dependent on the minority carrier lifetime. And so this will have important implications for the, the different solar cell structures. So our ability to form these defects in PERC is actually much easier than in aluminium back surface fields, um, solar cells, which essentially have lower efficiency and lower lifetime. So our, th this will affect our ability to hydrogenate the defects. And so if we want to um, get rid of this problem, we can introduce the concept of deodorant for getting rid of BO. So here we have a, a sample of, I'm sorry if this appears sexist, it's a degree for men, but it seemed quite fitting because their slogan is to stay protected all day long. And that's essentially what we're trying to do with this, uh, these solar cells, is to protect them all day long from the formation of this um, boron oxygen defect. And so it allows for this rapid elimination of the um, boron oxygen defect through a relay degradation in Tchaikovsky silicon through this advanced hydrogenation. And so, like anything, deodorant is most effective when you exercise. It's in my personal belief that you only need to use deodorant if you exercise. So now to, to go over our probably my most exciting result uh, with this technology is we've developed the first process around the world where we can completely mitigate this within 10 seconds um, using our UNSW advanced hydrogenation technology. And we've been able to demonstrate this on a large number of solar cells from our industrial partners. And importantly, these are not cells that are made in the labs. These come off straight off the production lines of um, industry standard um, solar cells that are going out into the market. And within um, this 10 second process, we can completely eliminate 
this, uh, this uh, degradation. And it means we can recover, on average, 1% absolute inefficiency, which is quite substantial in the, in the scheme of things. And so here's a, a sample data set of what we've been able to do. So looking at it in action, we can take one of our industrial um, PERC solar cells, starts off with a, an open circuit voltage of about 647 millivolts. And I'd like to say thank you for, to, um, to David Payne and Catherine Chan for this animation. So we start the process and we start to degrade the solar cell. And this is as these defects start to form. And then we have a, a reaction where this hydrogenation takes over and leads to this permanent recovery. And the exciting aspect about our technology compared to, or one of the exciting aspects compared to what's already on avail available on the market in a much slower time frame, less effective, is that we can actually passivate other defects in the device at the same time. So we can actually take an industrial solar cell um, and arrive at higher stabilised efficiencies than um, what they can produce straight off the production line. So not only are we looking at um, avoiding the formation of this boron oxygen defect or this light induced degradation, we can achieve higher stabilised efficiencies. And we also have uh, similar mechanisms that are happening in the multicrystalline silicon and we've um, been able to show that we can mitigate this in a, a number of minutes as well. So we take our industry standard PERC cells, one group doesn't get our, our advanced hydrogenation technology and process and it degrades quite substantially. Whereas within minutes using our, our technology, we can completely eliminate LID and arrive at higher stabilised efficiencies. And, and this is looking really exciting for the industry that now has some tools uh, and solutions for this, this defect. And so looking at the processes for LID elimination, we can do it during metallization or just after while we're cooling down in the belt furnace. We have processes for the laminator and also in the field, which brings me to question number four is, what company owns this iconic building? And secondly, um, what PV technology is used here? And I'll give you a hint, this was developed at UNSW. So we've also, to understand this uh, defect system, we've been looking at modelling. And uh, it allows us to point to the key problem of why this has been such an issue for the industry. And it's really, it's the, uh, the availability of these defects to, um, to enable this passivation. So here's an example animation uh, where if we're just looking at the time to form the defects, knowing that we can't passivate a defect that hasn't formed, so we have to form them all first before we can passivate them. So as we increase the, uh, the temperature, the reaction rate goes up and the time to form all of the defects goes down. And for solar cells, we really need a process in the order of about one second duration. And you'll see that to do that, we should be looking at a process temperature of about 500 degrees. But unfortunately, what happens when we bring the other reactions in the system into place? So again, looking at this temperature as it goes up, now we have all of these different four reactions. I won't actually go into the details of this, but the key is on the right hand side where we've got this effectiveness. And as we go up in temperature, the effectiveness drops. And you'll see is once we get up to the 500 degrees, when we've got this suitable time frame, suddenly we may as well not bother. It's going to be about 1% effectiveness. So we've, we've figured out a couple of keys as how to accelerate this, um, this defect formation to, to solve LID. So we can look at um, effectiveness here. We're looking at varying this hydrogenation reaction rate. And so really the key on this graph is just looking at what's happening with the blue curve. And we want to be right up the top. And as we vary this reaction rate by four orders of magnitude, we'll see that we can increase the effectiveness, but this process doesn't actually get any quicker. The, and the answer lies in this availability of the defects. So now when we increase the, the defect formation rate uh, for, for a standard hydrogen passivation rate, we see that we can improve both improve the effectiveness of this passivation, but more importantly, it actually gets quicker. So we're now looking at towards one second processes, um, theoretically, for this. And this is really the, the key to solving LID in solar cells. So if we want to take our oh, some industry state-of-the-art methods and call that the old method, so 
And this is, I guess, what is currently available on the market with industrial tools for LID. It will take about 40 seconds um, to uh, essentially get rid of most of this light induced degradation. And um, I'm afraid that we don't have non-disclosure agreements with all of you, so I've had to um, normalise this graph. So, so we're talking arbitrary temperature units. And you'll see that the, the quickest um, time we can get to basically get rid of this um, LID is when we operate at about 4.25 arbitrary units. And so if we then want to go to our new process, which we've demonstrated on this, these industrial solar cells, you can see that um, it's more effective and it's quicker. So now we can go up to higher temperatures. This time, I think it was about 5.75 arbitrary units. And that enables an acceleration of all of the reactions in the system. And we can do this without sacrificing the effectiveness. And so we can use these advanced models that we've developed here to understand and optimise processes for the industry. And we've also been, uh, I'm sorry, uh, th this, with this new process, we can bring this time down to about three seconds to get the same level of effectiveness. So it's now compatible with this high throughput um, requirements for the, for the solar industry. So as another aspect of the, the modelling, and this has been done together with uh, Jose Bilbao, so we've taken empirical weather data available on the internet um, based on different locations around the world, Hamburg, Sydney, Tucson, and um, Ulsan and uh, Wuhan. And there are models available, and we have quite a bit of expertise here, where we can predict module operating temperatures based on the mounting structure. So these are essentially, um, I guess, large centralised um, PV plants where we have flat ground and a rack mounted system on, on tilt of the equator. And we can predict that the stability of this passivation we generate over the long term operation in the field. And we can see that if we assume an operation time of 40 years, it's of no concern um, to this a potential destabilisation. And this is the worst case scenario although this can actually depend on the mounting structure and how these solar panels are integrated into the, um, the, uh, the module. And then we can look at um, the prediction of the time to passivate defects in the field. So again, um, using this model to predict based on the, the temperatures and reaction rates, how long it will take to both form the defects and um, then passivate it. And so you'll be able to see that this varies depending on when we install these modules in the field or as well as the location around the world based on temperature. Th these are very, very temperature dependent reaction rates. And so that brings me to another question of who designed this iconic lookalike building that's, I'll, I'll give you a hint, it's, it's in Sydney. And um, bonus question is if you can name the two solar based research institutes um, in the current uh, country of origin of this person. So in terms of overcoming performance limiting defects, we've been working with a whole range of companies all around the world to, um, integrating our technologies. And so we've been able to demonstrate these in pilot production with multiple world record efficiencies. Unfortunately, I can only highlight what's been publicly announced and released in the public domain. Um, so we've got a whole range on these, these conventional aluminium back surface field. This is just on the, the uh, Chikrolsi, so the monocrystalline silicon in the range of uh, going up towards 20%. Um, again, with PERC, um, some of them up to, I guess, 21.4. There are some slightly higher efficiencies than that now, but essentially they still incorporate this hydrogen passivation technique through eliminating this um, boron oxygen defect. And for those N-type lovers, we also have some results that have used our simplified hydrogenation processes, our laser doping technology, so um, after my work at IMEC, where I integrated both of these techniques um, during my PhD, they've just announced a new world record of 22.5%. And some of our friends down at ANU have um, shown that on Apollon Solar's um, upgraded metallurgical grade uh, silicon using our, our hydrogenation processes where they incorporate this uh, manipulation of the hydrogen charge states, they have achieved 21.5%. So thank you. Thank you.